Hello there. Welcome back, everybody. So uh, we're going to go into our next session all about angel investing. And I am super excited to find out what our panelists have to say. We have some uh, uh, angel investors, some of them with some deep experience on, on this discussion. It will be moderated by Tommy Davis from the Global African Business Angels Hello Network. There. Welcome back, everybody. So and um, we're go into our next session. also um, we have Stephen Google from Victoria Ventures and as well as Mariam Kamel from AUC Angel. Um, Tommy, please take it away. Thank you very, very much, Neander, and welcome everybody to this uh, Africa Tech Summit session on um, angel investing. Uh, the main theme we want to look at, especially, I'm quite sure everybody's heard of the recent $200 million um, acquisition of uh, Stripe, uh, by Stripe of um, of Paystack, um, and everybody's quite excited. I'm particularly excited because members of my syndicate uh, were doing up to 100x on that uh, particular deal. So, um, Stephen, Mariam, um, what uh, we're sort of going to try and look at is first and foremost, can angels actually fill? this funding gap that uh, COVID-19 is bringing along. If uh, you do a short introduction of yourself and then uh, treat that topic, that'd be nice. Over to you, Miriam. Thank you very much, and thank thank you for having me on this panel. So I currently manage AUC Angels. The AUC stands for the American University in Cairo. Uh, we're actually the first university-based angel investor network in the MENA region. Um, and our mission at AUC Angels is really to build an angel investment network for the university's alumni and friends. Um, we provide a strong pipeline for our angel investors, you know, facilitate deal flow, and generally support innovative uh, Egyptian and regional startups secure seed funding. Um, in partnership with AUC's Venture Lab, which is an accelerator, um, our investors get access to vetted, highly scalable startups that um, have already launched um, their products and services, have proven traction. Um, so yeah, that's what we do at AC Angels. Thanks for that, Mariam. Stephen, do you want to tell us about uh, Victoria Business Angel Network? Indeed. Uh, thanks, uh, Tommy. I'm uh, diving in from uh, Nairobi, Kenya. I am uh, the co-founder of Victoria Business Angels Network, which is a network that's uh, focused on uh, making investments in East Africa. At the moment, we're making investments in Kenya. Uh, we were established in 2017. Uh, and our key role uh, really is just to take our angels, uh, sort of like offer education to them, and then after that, provide deal flow for them for making investments. Uh, at the moment, we have over 40 uh, angel investors who are part of the network. Uh, we've made five investments uh, so far, and really excited about the journey. I should also add that I'm part of the Africa Business Angels Network, uh, where, you know, as part, then we are a network of networks that looks at uh, creating more angel groups across Africa and most importantly, getting those angel networks to make investments into early stage opportunities. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Thank you very, very much, uh, Stephen. In case you guys are wondering about the letters A BAN, Africa Business Angel Network, and G BAN. Uh, my name is Tommy Davis. Uh, I am a co founder of the Lagos Angel Network, which operates out of Lagos, Nigeria, uh, investing in Nigerian startups. We've been around since 2012 and have a portfolio of something around 60 odd uh, companies under our belt. Um, in that capacity, I am also the founding president of the African Business Angel Network which as Stephen, my vice president for East Africa was telling you is the network of networks on the continent where we look uh, to ensure we educate and we facilitate angel investing. And finally, I also sit on the board of the Global Business Angel Network, which is the aggregator of uh, continental uh, angel networks, including the Indian Angel Network and the uh, Angel Capital association in the united states and the european business angel network so that's me in a nutshell and let's get to our first question 
which I alluded to earlier. Um, Stephen, we see a post-COVID funding gap arising. We've seen the decline in inbound um, funding um, into startups. Um, can angels really fill that gap? What are your thoughts? Um, thanks, Tommy. Uh, that's a complex question, right? Um, and maybe we should start it uh, from the point that uh, angels, yes, they can uh, fill uh, part of that gap. I don't think the full gap can be filled. Uh, but the factors to consider here is that uh, there's also some angels who've gotten hit by COVID. Uh, I'll speak about our experience in Kenya, where we have a number of angel investors who are very active in the real estate uh, space, and especially commercial real estate. Um, and to tell you the truth, this has been very tough for them. As you know, commercial real estate has been uh, hit uh, you know, with people working from home and uh, all the measures that governments uh, took around uh, you know, stopping uh, the, the spread of uh, COVID. Um, having said that, uh, during this period, we've seen so many uh, deals sort of coming our way. And for the angels who had uh, capital, uh, they've been active in terms of uh, putting in cash. Uh, just today, I was reading a news piece that was saying that between the month of May and uh, the, the month of uh, September, if you compare that with the previous uh, six months, so not six months, but four months, um, uh, the number of registrations of businesses in Kenya has actually grown by 95%. Uh, so there's been a lot of uh, new sort of like businesses getting founded. Um, and to that extent, uh, for our angel network, we've looked at so many more deals. We've not necessarily made uh, the investments uh, so far, uh, but I see the opportunities where then as an angel investor, if you have capital, uh, there's good opportunities that you can participate in at, at this point. Um, I'll, I'll pause there and maybe just hear what uh, Mariam uh, has to uh, add. Thanks, Stephen. Mariam, um, I mean, we've seen uh, the rise of logistics, We've seen the rise of mm -hmm. telehealth, um, but are local angel investors really in a position to fill that gap? Um, North, North Africa, which is your theater of operations, I mean, you guys are a washing angels with yourselves, the Alex angels, the Cairo angels. What, what are your thoughts? So um, we, very interestingly, actually, in the first, I would say about, six weeks since uh, at least the lockdown was announced in Cairo, we saw a tremendous surge of uh, in membership, right? We went from our network had, I would say about 35 to 40 members up to 60 in a very short period of time. And so what was interesting at that time is there was a lot more interest in general in the space, more people sitting at home, exploring different opportunities, I think one out of, you know, curiosity, but also with time, spending behaviors change, particularly for a high net worth individuals, right? What they would spend, let's say, on travel, shopping, <laughs> things of the sort, um, you know, weren't necessarily happening as much. And so there was, let's say, excess capital that they were looking to invest elsewhere. And I think what Stephen brought up with um, real estate is interesting because real estate is typically where people look to kind of put their money for both, you know, capital appreciation and yield. Now, once you've explored that, you know, uh, you start looking for other opportunities. So we had a surge of uh, memberships and a lot more angel investors coming on board. So I had to do a lot of sort of um, educational programs for them, as Stephen was also mentioning. And then there were a lot of startups seeking uh, investment, particularly those that were in what you can refer to as sort of low touch economy, right? A lot of food delivery. Delivery was very common anyway, right? But uh, that was a big thing. A telemedicine for sure. Um, what else? We actually closed fintech. I mean, listen, fintech is always, you know, the flavor of the month every month. But uh, a lot of people that were maybe sort of on the fence in terms of investments decided to make uh, their first, you know, investment in fintech. Uh, looking towards financial inclusion, peer-to-peer -peer lending. I mean, it's been interesting. We've closed, um, we've been around for about two years and a half. We'd closed about nine deals or eight deals pre-COVID and about three, almost four deals. We actually just signed the term sheet for one uh, this past week post. So yeah, it's, um, uh, and listen, let me say something. The deals are pre-seed 
the amounts aren't very big uh, to kind of, so let's say there are a lot of new members, but many of them are in to explore the space, not necessarily to deploy capital, right? And the people that had the deeper pockets, they're a bit more conservative than they used to be. So let's, you know, not paint a completely rosy picture of the situation. But that's what we've seen. Thanks a lot, Mariam, for sharing that. I mean, uh, Stephen, Mariam, that reflects sort of what we've been experiencing um, over on the West Coast, uh, where um, in May, um, Jared and um, Isabel uh, managed to convince me, finally, we got the Diaspora Angel Network going. And what they're doing is actually co-investing with local angel networks like uh, Victoria Business Angels and Lagos Angels and others. Something I know that Cairo Angels have been doing like forever. Um, so what I find interesting though about that is the valuations have gone down, but the transactions have gone up. So whereas in a quarter land, if we did three deals, that was a good quarter. Okay, seeing five deals in a quarter, um, is is a bit up on the numbers and that's what's happening uh at rn2 um and they are going into low touch as uh, as you talked about uh, logistics tele uh tele education in in one case edutech and of course uh, fintech is broadening out from just payments to start to look at savings and to start to look at investments so we're seeing quite a few interesting things in that uh, direction. So I think the consensus is we'll need a help, we'll still need help from abroad, although we're doing quite nicely. Is, is that a fair summation on that question, Stephen? Um, definitely, I mean, uh, the help from abroad is welcome and I think it will help to, you know, increase the number of deals. Uh, but then it, I think it's also good just to mention that uh, if you look at, because uh, there's also angel funds or micro VC funds who already have capital. Uh, on that front, there's been many more deals taking place because then, you know, they've, they've had the capital with them. They're looking at the transactions uh, as they're coming in and in the sectors that you've mentioned, which I guess are uh, global uh, across Africa, it's the same things we're seeing in uh, Kenya in terms of the uh, sectors that are in the, the, that deals are coming from. So to that extent, it's not only so, uh, the, the, the money from abroad, it's also just the uh, micro VC funds, uh, which I've seen locally that have also deployed a bit of capital during this time. Um, high net worth individuals. You talked about them being more conservative with their money, but uh, slightly because of no uh, luxury spend, being a bit a washing cash. Um, how do we get them into the angel game? How do we convince them that it's worth not just putting money, but spending a little bit of time um, helping these startups grow? What are your thoughts on how we do that? Your, your university professors in your case. You're on exactly. mute, by the way. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, I think this is a really interesting question because this is a very big part of what we do. You know, we have no problem actually uh, developing an interesting pipeline of startups. But when it comes to, you know, onboarding investors, it's a little trickier, right? And, and the truth is they do come in waves. Right. Um, but, you know, one of the things is to just let them know that we're out there. And I have to admit, you know, it is sort of um, there are certain people that end up being connectors. Right. And, you know, they'll mention what they've done and that they're investing at dinner parties. Right. And they'll let their friends know and they'll let their friends know, et cetera. So to a certain and, and I think that's, you know, why sometimes it, it comes in waves. But um, to the extent that, you know, also just the overall growth of the ecosystem, right? Uh, the number of conferences, webinars, we've had a lot more access also to uh, people of African origin that are based abroad that normally would have had to be physically present to attend some of these pitches, right? And had to be physically present to attend some of these summits. And all of a sudden now, they're not at, a dis at the disadvantage, right? That they thought they were. And when they come to look at valuations, in Africa vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, what they would normally see wherever they are, you know, and they know the potential is huge. They understand the market well. There's frontier. So I think on our part, you know, we really have to spread the word. We have to provide 
access. I mean, I think, you know, one of the silver linings of COVID is the fact that borders, boundaries, in some ways, mean a lot less than they used to. And I think this is, should be particularly the case for angel investments. Thanks a lot, Mariam. So, Stephen, COVID has caused the death of distance as we've all moved online. And that presents an opportunity to engage high net worth individuals uh, into the world of angel investing. What are your thoughts? Um, thanks, Tommy. Uh, so I would say to, to a certain extent it has in the sense that we interact. I mean, right now we're interacting with different parts uh, of the world, uh, the three of us. Um, uh, and to that extent, you can say borders have been broken. But uh, angel investments, at least uh, in, in my experience, is very much a local spot, right? Because you, you not only want to just uh, put in cash into the startups, but you also want to make sure that you're adding value in terms of your connections, uh, in terms of uh, your, your your networks, you know, the, the mentorship that you're able to provide. The mentorship you can probably do anywhere, uh, but the connections are very important. Uh, and so to that extent, even when we are looking at uh, co deals with uh, any other angels, we, we have some angel investors from, uh, you know, European countries, from the US, who sort of are making investments here. And one of the key criteria when they're making investments here is when they know that there's a local angel investor who's making that investments because they know that they're going to be looking at that deal they're going to help in terms of the due diligence they will probably sit on the board and they'll make their you know connections work for that uh, and so to that extent yes uh, you know you you will have this situation where people can invest anywhere but you still need to have this network of angel investors uh, in different countries that are able to uh, then to do the dd and to assist in terms of uh, the sitting on the board and so forth Having said that, uh, one of the silver linings of COVID is also that people have realized uh, you can't pile all your cash in the stock exchange, uh, in the, the real estate space, you know, the, the normal investments that we all know about. Uh, and I've been very surprised that people who are previously not as interested, I've sort of like called me and said, hey, you know, I've seen you talking about this angel investment uh, discussion. Could we kindly have a chat? I want to understand a bit better because they realize that the, 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 the future looks very different. Uh, so to that extent, you're having a bit more people now, a bit more convinced of the thesis. And, uh, you know, with Paystack having happened, uh, these people were like, wow, how much did they make again? I know it's not uh, the entire portfolio, but, you know, we need that kind of information out there because then it excites the interest. Uh, and then once the angels are involved, then there's a lot of impact that happens with that. Thank you. Thanks for that, Stephen. I mean, I, I'm quite excited uh, about the possibilities. And if you look at the thinking behind Dan, the Diaspora Angel Network, that, that is the whole uh, element of it, is starting to attract people who otherwise would not be exposed to the opportunities uh, on the continent and getting them to participate. But uh, I think I agree with you. It is a local sport because if we're talking of mentoring and advisory especially, um, it's local in the context that you have to understand the environment in which the startup is functioning. Because otherwise you are not in a position to provide advice. So for high net worth individuals, um, it, we need to help them understand the message that the cash is very important. I'm not belittling it whatsoever, but what you actually bring to the table as an angel investor, which is more valuable than even the cash, is that knowledge and expertise of the context in which the startup is being built, okay? And your ability to connect the startup to the resources it requires that will nurture it to growth. So um, that's that's an interesting message to get out to uh, angel investors, which sort of leads us to the final question in, in this our uh, brief conversation, which is, Beyond providing capital, what's the angel investor value add, Mariam? What role? Um, you know, one thing that Stephen mentioned, and I, you know, really agree 100% with what he was saying, is really the advisory and the mentorship role and the connections are really key. Now, to be fair, not all of the angel investors are particularly interested in providing, you know, the time or making the commitment towards that, or at least not for their entire portfolio, let's say. 
Um, and not all the startups understand the real value behind this, okay? But for the most part, you know, connections are key. And we really see this, I think, in our, you know, post-transaction um, interactions, right? We do these uh, quarterly uh, calls between our investors and startups, and this is really when you see, um, of course, the startups have to report on their performance, et cetera, but generally, as they grow, they do um, try, they try and be as resourceful as possible when it comes to uh, their investors, try and see what connections, how they can connect, connect them, uh, et cetera. I see it happening in some industries, uh, I would say more than others, health tech for sure, fintech, I would say the logistics guys, chances are um, they're from the industry. So they don't necessarily, you know, um, capitalize on that as much. So once again, it is it would vary uh, sector to sector, but for sure. And and actually, some of the investors uh, also help not in terms of strategy and growth marketing, let's say, but in terms of connecting them with other um, in in their next round of funding. And this, you know, is invaluable. Thanks, Mario. Steven, uh, we've said cash is the cheapest of the investments an angel makes. What roles do they play and, you know, what makes that statement true? Um, uh, th th thanks, Tommy. And uh, I, I do agree with what Mariam has just said, you know, 100%, you know the mentorship uh, and the connections. And I'll just give an example here. One of our first, or one of my first deals, which was also the first for the angel network is called Bimo. And they have a retail POS uh, system. They connect with small shops uh, and they create this ecosystem where then banks can plug in if they want to lend to these uh, small shops. Um, you know, suppliers can plug in if they want to distribute products into that. When we started out with the startup, uh, we had a copy with the entrepreneur probably every two weeks. Uh, which was just uh, all about just reflecting about, you know, they've been to the market, uh, what uh, kind of feedback are they getting from the market? Um, and it was just around panel beating the, 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 the idea into a business opportunity. Uh, and that took quite a bit of time. And if you imagine, I'd already put in my cash in there, but I had to follow on with sort of like these coffees, which uh, I guess I, I should have been charging for in addition to, but you know, you're not charging for them. And that's why I guess the cash is the small bit, right? And then after that, there's the work that needs to be done. Uh, but then even some of the clients that they were able to get, they connected with a couple of FMCGs on top of that. Those were connections that, uh, between myself and the other angel investors. We picked up the phone, called someone, organized a meeting, and at times even came for the meeting and sat in there just to make the introduction and to ensure that the conversation just uh, does move ahead and uh, follow up uh, that conversation. So really that's why then you're saying that cash is a, you know, is a list of the things you're making investments. After that, you need to make your investments work. And for that, you need to do a lot of mentorship. Uh, there's your connections. Uh, there's times where if the startup doesn't respond as uh, your uh, contact expects, they're going to call you and say, hey, you connected me to this, uh, you know, this founder. Are they for real? Uh, are they going to follow through? And so to a certain extent, your credibility is also on the line as to whether you're sort of like making the right connections. Uh, and so then as an angel investor, you need to be thinking about those additional aspects. And there's one thing I like mentioning to angels when they join our network, is that for you as an angel investor, you need to make, you know, you, you pick companies in which you can make your return, right? And this basically means that you look at a company and ask, where can I add value? Because ultimately, you're quote unquote, partly responsible for creating your return. It's not a financial investment, as in the stock exchange where you put in your cash and sit back. But here you have to, you know, help to create that return that, uh, or the future that you want to see. Thank you, Tommy. Thanks, Stephen. I had to take notes there. Thank you very much. That was actually quite insightful. Um, and I think uh, in terms of this, we, we are all in agreement that um, cash being replaceable, okay, if I lose $10,000 on a deal, I can get it back. It's replaceable is the cheapest of the investments. Uh, the second most expensive of our investments is actually making connections, as you were describing, Stephen, which is reputational risk um, is at stake because your brand is associated with any references uh, that you make as an angel uh, in terms of introducing the startup to your network. 
uh, that is the second most, but the most expensive, okay, which is the one, you know, we are labor about is time because it's irreplaceable. You know, you use it once and that's it. So that is why it is the most expensive of the three and the angels uh, should treat it uh, sort of in, in that particular order. Is that a fair summary? Yes, Tommy, that's a very good uh, summary. Uh, Mariam, do you agree with that breakdown? What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think um, this is a big part of, uh, you know, also the learning process for angel investors, right? And so when we were talking about bringing, you know, more high net, net worth individuals, I think, you know, a part of the conversation in the very beginning has to be um, that they do have uh, this ability for value creation that uh, for some of them they do need to realize it does go beyond uh, the business or however you know they came about in terms of their own wealth creation right so it is a learning process for the angel investors as well and so I think a lot of the reason that you know people do this get excited about it and get really into it is apart from the social impact i think which is another thing we can discuss uh, but also the personal development that they go through throughout the process of this right they don't necessarily have all the answers all the time and so i think in their process of the mentoring the connections and the advisory um they there is a lot of growth that happens for them whether personally or professionally that i think you know many of them may have reached a certain pinnacle within their career so you know it you know it does become very motivating and, and exciting for them it makes it fun in simple terms well i mean that's an interesting uh interesting thought i'd, I'd want to expand on and then get your views on and, and that is the benefits of being an, an angel because we've talked about different aspects of it and the social impact uh the exposure to new knowledge uh the recognition for for services provided these are all contributory factors that we sometimes don't really bring to the fore when we're trying to share with angel investors what the nature of the opportunity is uh stephen you've managed to amass an amazing number of members um what's what's the thinking on this um tommy and uh, I, I think as we continue I, i'm also seeing that uh there's some questions for us uh, that uh, the panelists are asking, uh, but uh, just in terms of how we've been able to amass uh, the, the members, it's really one, there's the interest, uh, there's the fact that people want to be part of this conversation uh, after being in the other asset classes. I think uh, two, I would say, you know, there's so many opportunities that are constantly being thrown out uh, that uh, people start asking themselves, um, and especially, let me speak about the Kenya scenario where we've had some opportunities which have been funded from outside uh, and there's a lot of information that has come out uh, just in terms of how the funding in Kenya has gone where probably 90% of the funding that comes goes to expert founders. Um, and the, the challenge with that is, is people who come in and they're saying, okay, what can we do as ourselves to sort of like uh, sponsor or to push our ecosystem? Um, and so there's that element of can we also fund people locally who are solving local problems that we're seeing? Um, the, the last bit of it is, uh, you know, people want to make some money. <laughs> and I think there's uh, probably opportunities for making money uh, out of this. Uh, but uh, important just to say is that uh, it's a lot of hard work to get an angel network to work. Uh, and you need to have what Maria mentioned at the beginning, that someone who tries to midwife uh, the transaction uh, and tries to move uh, the angel into a point where they're making deals. Uh, oh, back to you, Tommy. Thanks a lot for that. And guess who's uh, joining us now? It's Zach. Hi, Tommy. Hi, Zach. You want to do an intro? Absolutely. And, and apologies to everyone listening. For some very bizarre reason, I had this at 5 p.m. Lagos, and I obviously got it mixed for some reason. Apologies. Um, good afternoon. Good evening, everyone, wherever in the world you are. My name is Zach George. I have a couple of roles. I'm the co-founder of Startup Bootcamp Africa, which is one of the largest global accelerators. And I also am a principal at NetBank Venture Capital that focuses on um, series A and Series B deals, and then in the personal capacity, I've been actively angel investing in African tech ventures since 2014, and I've got a portfolio of just over 50 five zero ventures, and I'm very happy to share some of my insights with uh, with the panel. 
Thanks a lot, Zach. Now, we've got a whole bunch of questions that have come from the audience. So that um, we, we try and get through as many of them as possible, I'm going to assign them to individuals. All right. So, uh, Zach, um, since you're the first uh, sort of the last past the post, here's a question. We keep hearing about VC budgets being squeezed by COVID, but are angels also affected? Are angel networks struggling to sign up new members at this time? Um, I'm asking you because I know Stephen has an answer and I know Mariam also alluded to the answers, but I'd like to get your thoughts on it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the best way to sort of talk about these sorts of things is to give people facts and not just opinions. I mean, opinions are fantastic, but facts are better. So if you look at where the so VC in Africa started in, 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 in all earnesty and in all fullness, probably between 2013 and 2014 was when, was when most, you know, good VC funds had their vintage years. So if you look at deployment of capital, uh, there's a good between three to four years still left in a lot of VC funds in Africa. So just because of COVID, you, you know, you're um, in a situation where LPs still need to see GPs deploy that capital. So even though there's been a slight drop in, uh, in demand and there's been, you know, tw between 25 and 30 to 35% haircuts and valuations, there's still a lot of capital that has to be deployed. So if you look at just the amount of venture capital activity on the African continent measured by anything more than a million dollars, that's, that's a good benchmark for, from a round size. If you look at the first nine months of 2019 and the first nine months of 2020, there's a 25% increase, very important, not a decrease, an increase in the total size of venture capital deals done in Africa. It's probably the only continent in the world where there's an increase. What has happened, however, is the total number of deals that have been done have shrunk. So there's a disproportionately higher part of the pie available to founders that have repurposed your assets and have survived COVID and have adjusted accordingly. So if you're a founder and you've been able to, like I mentioned, repurpose your assets, be very smart about your fixed versus variable costs and how you've been able to um, to just ration your resources, um, there's a lot of capital available for you from existing VC funds. So that's an important thing to measure. Absolute size is, has, has actually grown, but the number of deals has shrunk. Now, from an angel risk, oh, okay, you were getting there. Because yeah. I wanted us to focus on the angel networks. Yeah, so because, because valuations are... I wouldn't say at all-time lows, but at, are at relative lows compared to a similar period last year and the year before that. Um, angels typically invest anywhere from 5% to 20% of their net worth. And smart angels like folks that are part of ABAN and, and, and all the different local angel networks are aware that you invest your capital over a period of time. As Tommy, you have alluded to on several of your angel investing masterclasses. So, um, if you allocate your capital over a two to three year period and you do, I'd say between two and five on the high side deals a year, um, angels should be able to still deploy a reasonable amount of capital during these, these, these challenging times. So I see no, I mean, at, le at least the closest angel network friends of mine have been deploying capital quite aggressively during this period. Um, because of the lower valuations, because um, of the ability to, to get in. Uh, um, a lot of Series A ready companies are now doing pre-Series A rounds. So you're, you're able to buy better companies at lower valuations because of the, uh, the economic situation. And so I've seen angel investing, at least in the deals that I'm involved in, actually pick up during this period, um, which is always not a bad thing. And I'm sure Warren Buffett agrees with 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 that line of thinking to you thanks uh thanks for that uh question from the audience uh this one's for you mariam um and maybe stephen wants to take a punt at it too what's your advice to someone wanting to make their first angel investment where do they start what should they expect well it's uh <laughs> um 
it's um, I mean, it really, it's a function of what stage they're at, right? So it's it's a bit difficult to um, answer that quite generically. But I mean, I f I think the first thing to do is um, for them to do their homework, right? Understand the market well. Understand the, what the different angel groups or you know whether they're looking at you know angel investments or others. But um, uh, understand who you know they could have access to. Right. Um, as Stephen was alluding to, in many ways, it is a local sport. So who is within your locality? OK. Um, and uh, figure out how you can connect with them. Make sure that obviously you're ready with your story, your pitch. Um, practice makes perfect. Uh, this is, you know, really and, and sometimes actually I give the advice to uh, start with the investors you're least interested in first, right? Because by the time you're done, you'll have done this pitch so many times that'll get better. So save your really good pitches with the investors you're really keen on um, getting on board. Make sure you know you have uh, you can do your pitch, whether the quick elevator pitch or the more elongated ones. Um, I think you know for us, I have to say you know we're a little spoiled in the sense that we get a lot of vetted opportunities that are coming out of Excel accelerator programs, right? This is absolutely a good way of uh, preparing uh, yourself also for this. Thanks for that. Stephen, from the other side, as a potential angel investor who's uh, wanting to make their very first investment in a startup, um, where do they start? What should they expect? Um, thanks, Tommy. Uh, the first thing I would say is that, first of all, just do it. Uh, I feel like the first deal is the one, the main hurdle for most angel investors to get started. But having said that, uh, you know, it helps a lot if uh, there's some education that comes with that. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a six, over 64 angel groups that are part of ABAN that you could be uh, part of in this case, where at least you can co-invest. Uh, that helps a lot in the first deal when you have someone who has a bit of experience that uh, you can co-invest with them. You can get some education just to think about, you know, the strategy you want to take, the kind of companies you want to invest, how much you want to put in. Zach mentioned the 5 to 10%. Uh, I know angels who started off putting 30% uh, of their total net worth. And then when that gets burnt, you know, you ask yourself whether it was the right decision. Um, so I'd say, you know, just do it, but then uh, get some education. Uh, uh, you know, join an angel who's a bit uh, experienced in the space that can lead the first deal at the very least. Um, in terms of the source of the deal, I think Maria mentioned that accelerators, incubators, your networks, uh, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I have like 30 seconds to add a small point there. If it's your first deal as an angel, I'd, I'd, I'd give you two pieces of advice because it, it helped me a lot when I started off. One is stick to local. So if you're if you're in South Africa, start with a South African company. It's it's always good as an angel to get your hands dirty and know your founders and know their clients and know their partners. It just gives you a lot of confidence that you can touch and feel what you're doing. Uh, and number two, if it's your first angel investment, join a syndicate. Um, uh, there are some um, geographies like the U.S. where you can do it online through Angel List. Angel List has plenty of syndicates uh, to choose from where you have a strong lead angel. But if you can't join a virtual syndicate like AngelList, join um, a physical syndicate like LAN or ABAN or SABAN or CAN, or all, all the different angel networks. And then you've got a portfolio of companies. Even if you're investing $20,000, you've got a stake, a small stake in three or four companies. That gives you confidence. You get quarterly reports, monthly reports, and then that sort of incentivizes you to go in. But if you're putting a, a huge amount of money into a company in Kenya and you physically live in Cape Town and it's all your eggs in one basket, it's just going to disincentivize you from going forward. So that would be my, my opinion. Thanks for that, Zach. Uh, much, much appreciated uh, in closing out, uh, helping to close out uh, that question. Um, the last and closing question uh, for everybody uh, is, is is sort of twofold and you all run networks or and it's more the question of what is the nature um, of the relationship between angel investors and institutional investors i.e VCs um, how do you see that on the continent is it growing is it turns is it you know what are the dimensions of that um, if you'd be kind enough to do a minute each I'm going to start with you Mariam uh, again 
Thank you, Tommy. Uh, I think one of, um, at least in, in Egypt, um, you know, this is a, a current trend, is the presence of micro VCs is really bridging the angel space and the VC space. And to the extent that we have certain angel investors that are investing in their personal capacity, but then also through these uh, VCs, uh, micro VCs. So um, I think in general, uh, you know, angel investors kind of do come in, obviously, at a time where, you know, the, op it, the, the you know, the, the stakes are higher, right? And um, in many ways, you know, they look forward for the VCs coming in, but they also, in many cases, do feel that they crowd them out, come sort of take, take over. Um, they may have less of a, say, of a say, are paid less attention to. This may be sort of, the, or historically at least, this was uh, everybody's experience. But now I think with angels playing more of a role um, in light of VCs not deploying, or at least, you know, in Egypt or, uh, yes, doing less deals. I don't want to say deploying less capital, right? Absolutely doing less deals. Uh, angels playing a bit more of an active role. I think that's changing a little bit. But I think also startups are starting to recognize, you know, the different roles everybody plays uh, at the varying stages, particularly in terms of mentoring and advisory. And so I think in many ways that relationship changes. Uh, and, in, and also some of the angel investors end up being relieved, right, as the VCs come and sort of take the baton and, and take over. Thanks a lot for that, uh, Mariam. Now, gentlemen, I'm going to give you a minute each to respond so that uh, we finish dead on time. And I'm going to start with your 60 seconds, Zach. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, I, I love the baton analogy. I use that a lot. So thank you, Miriam. Um, it is it is a relay race. So the angels usually take part in small rounds, but to a large extent, they help validate product market fit for the incoming VC. So angels play two critical roles with VCs. They provide an opportunity for companies to get to their Series A rounds a lot quicker than they would have expected. Uh, in Africa, I've been doing this for about 10 years. It takes anywhere from three to four years for a startup from its first uh, founders, friends and family check to get to a Series A because it just takes that long and angels help shorten that process. Um, secondly, you're now seeing in a, a lot of super angels participate alongside VCs. So even, I mean, some, I, was, I was recently part of a pretty large series seed round for Nigerian FinTech where VCs made up, the round was way oversubscribed, but the founders insisted on having a couple of super angels alongside the VCs. On um, that note, yeah. um, I'm gonna have to let Stephen have the last word. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Tommy. I won't repeat anything that's been said. The only thing I'll add is that um, also VCs are sources of deal flow. So for us, the relations we've created with VCs is such that when they get any deals that they feel don't fit their criteria but fit our criteria, they will always throw that back to us with the expectation that once we've worked on it, it's something we can pass on to them in a, in a couple of years uh, down the line. Uh, I'll finish at that point thank, uh, so that I don't put in any more pressure. Yeah. Tommy, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Zach. George, Startup Bootcamp. Thank you, Mariam Camel, AUC Angels. And thank you, Stephen Gugu, ABAN. My name is Tommy Davis, GBAN. Uh, thank you all. Over to you, Neander. <laughs>